Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and producer of The Chats, and The Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I am in the home of Jill Carter in Newburgh, Indiana, way down in southern Indiana. Jill was Imsel, 1996. How are you, Jill? I'm doing well. How are you today, Doug? Great. I am so pleased you're doing this interview, and I thank you. <laughs> thank you, actually. I'm, I know you you haven't been interviewed very much. No. Some reason? Um, it's a little difficult to get a hold of me. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Let's let's go back to who you were when you were very young. Where are you from? I am from uh, a Quaker town in southern New Jersey. Actually, I was born in Philadelphia. And then my family moved to a place called Morristown, New Jersey. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite a oh, wealthy place. Um, and I, I grew up in a, you might say, a diverse sort of community. If, if we didn't even talk about diversity back then. Diverse, in, in fact, that the, the schools were integrated. Um, I, that's, that's pretty much it. And wealthy kids. And it was, it was a very good upbringing. Uh, my parents are from the South. I grew up in the South. And so in my home, it was more of a Southern upbringing. So I have a lot of Southern values. And I am currently researching my family, especially on my father's side. My father's uh, grandfather was um, the first circuit judge, elected judge in the state of Florida. Uh, and he was uh, unfortunately impeached um, because a lot of what you're seeing happening today happened back there. He, he was a slave. Uh, and, and I'm learning because books have been written about him. And, I, and the only reason I don't know about a lot about my, my family is because of the way my family was. Very private, very quiet. Uh, but if you listen in the Southern environment, if you listen, you picked up pieces. And so I knew that my father was, uh, great-grandfather was a judge. What was his name? Uh, Judge James Dean. Why was he impeached? He was, uh, well, <clears throat> one, he went to Howard University. He was valid, valid Victorian, uh, became a lawyer. Uh, was a Republican, which was back then what we call Democrats today. Yes. Um, and he also was a minister, um, so he had a lot of credentials for a long time, I thought. Uh, I was the only one to have uh, graduated from college, but that's after finding out what he did. I, but he was impeached because of uh, reconstruction and uh, uh, systematic uh, prejudice. He was impeached because back then there was a law that you could not Mix, do a mixed marriage as a judge. Uh, this gentleman said he was from Cuba, so he was not uh, a white man marrying uh, uh, a mulatto or person of color. Nonetheless, because of the racism and, and whites feeling that, uh, that blacks were progressing a lot further at the time. Uh, they drummed up this and uh, actually didn't lose his judgeship as per se because of, you know, what was happening in the session, the Senate and what have you. But the governor at the time, Governor Fleming, uh, took away his power to be a judge and then put a Cuban in, in his place, who was not elected. And uh, so he lost 
his judgeship uh, through that. But he was elected. He was well elected by numbers that, you know, out, um, outpace what, what you show. It wasn't a narrow win. It was a very uh, wide win uh, when he took on that, that role. You said he was a slave originally? Is yes, that... I'm reading that he was a slave. So he actually managed to move beyond that, attend university, and become a judge. And a minister, almost a bishop of uh, the African Methodist Episcopalian Church. How fascinating. I'm finding reading about him very fascinating. Um, and one of the things I, as reading, because again, I have books have been written about him is that he was a man of high integrity. Everything I read about my great-grandfather talks about his impeccable integrity. And so when I look back at how I've lived my life through integrity before I even, you know, I, I didn't discover this until about uh, 2008, okay? And uh, Governor Jed Bush at the time reinstated his judgeship in 2001. Wow! He was exonerated and so that's when a lot of history began to come out and was written about him. That's because I was, would occasionally try to go through the internet and see if I could find anything because I didn't have a lot of information. Uh, but then one day as I was again, let me try this and stumbled across it and I went, oh my god, look at this and got in touch with uh, the lawyer out of uh, Key West, because you know, Key West was one of uh, where he uh, resided, resided a lot. Okay. Um, and I'm also trying to even trace it back further because there's little bits that they talk about. And one was that as he was a minister and he enjoyed this particular church, that he presided over because they spoke the old, the old language. And I'm like, what language is he talking about? <laughs> you know? So um, I know part of that is of the Gullah, uh, that uh, part of that is of the Geech. And how I know that, because my mother kept referring to my father saying that he spoke Geech. Um, sometimes you can hear it in my speech uh, and it, it's funny because when I was down visiting, working actually in Florida, and uh, someone said, you have a very interesting accent. And one of the girls said, oh no, that is nothing but Geech. <laughs> for, for the benefit of the audience, would you tell us about Geech? What is that? Oh, well, you're asking me to tell you about it? It's from the Gullah Islands off of North Carolina. I'm not going to say I know a lot about it, but uh, the language that is spoken there is a, it's a dialect called Geech. Okay. All right. And um, I, I can't tell you more about that. And, and again, I'm still tracing what that is all about and exactly which islands are we talking about? Are we talking about, you know, coming from uh, Africa, and, and I did have that DNA test, and I'm going to go back and pull out the results, but coming from there, and you know, how they traveled, and, and then you stopped off at the islands, whether it was Jamaica, or uh, the Bahamas, or what have you, so one of those islands I have roots to, and then uh -huh. it goes back to the uh, North Carolina, to the, the Gullah, so um, just this week I was looking and, and it's interesting because if you can trace some of your family and back to who plantation you were assigned to, then it's, this traces you back to where their possible origins. Okay. okay. And so I, I'm beginning to look at that and, uh, and I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I think I see a pattern here. I think I, I'm beginning to solidify a little more of my history. Fascinating. My roots. But the biggest thing, the thing I take away 
from my <clears throat> reading about my great grandfather is that he was a person who fought for injustices. Um, unfortunately, he died a pauper. Uh, all of his uh, law books had to be sold to just to have the funeral. It was a big funeral from what I understand because he was a high level Mason. So there's a lot I'm learning about him. He was a high level Mason. Um, and then you got the fact that he was close to being a bishop and then he was a judge. I, was, I can imagine, you know, that they, that they tried to send him out well. Um, they, last couple of years ago, I spoke with the lawyer and he said that they were going to put together a park or create a park and, in his name, so. Um, Located where? In Jacksonville, Florida. I okay. It's either Jacksonville or the Key West. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> a lot of my family resides out of, on my father's side from Florida. On my mother's side, it's uh, Savannah, Georgia. Wow. <laughs> so, but, but that's all to say that um, I believe that I, I've really let, led my life the same way. Um, it's like it is skip a generation and here you are, you know. Um, Can you give me an example of that? And in, in how I've uh, led my way, yes. my life the same way. Yes. Well, one integrity has been so paramount to me, and in fighting injustices. Uh, one of the issues came down of questioning my integrity. Um, and that's that's almost like the core of me. Uh, in fighting for a situation uh, for some employees. I, a little bit about my background is that I spent a lot of, maybe part of 30 some years uh, in HR. I have a degree, I have a business master's degree in business and a, a dual degree in HR. So okay. um, as an HR person, I've been very different. I've been different all my life and I believe in being consistent and fair. Um, and that's a very interesting line. You have to walk, walk when you're working in corporate America. Um, because management expects you to be on their side. And I've been on a, what is right, is yeah. the belief. So I have believe in doing what is right. I believe in a lot of integrity. Uh, my father raised me to remember that my, my word is my bond. Um, because that's all you have. He said, that's all you have is your word. You know? So don't say you're gonna do something and don't do it. If you commit to something, you really need to uh, move heaven to hell to do that. Otherwise, don't get it. So I've always lived my life that way. What has caused you to have to move heaven and hell to accommodate your integrity? An example? It could be anything, you know. Um, you, you're committed to being at a, a, a friend's house at a certain time. Well, I expect I need to be there on time, and it doesn't matter what I need to do, you're going to start early and you're going to make sure that you get there on time. Okay. Um, if you say that you are going to do, and I've said I'm going to deliver something, I'll give you an example. Uh, my, my little sister, she is long past, and some folks who may be watching this may know uh, Devin Davio. Um, shortly after I became Enzel, before I became Enzel, Devin asked me to be her best person in her wedding. Okay. And I said I would. All right. So, the minute I became Menzel, 
her partner turned to her and said, you got to understand she's until now. She may not be here for your wedding. Um, and, and Devin said to her, you don't know Jill. Mm. Jill will be here. And prior to becoming Ensel, I said there are a couple commitments I've made, a couple commitments I have to honor. Uh, so I made sure that I was there for Devin's wedding to stand beside Devin. Um, and Devin was like, you know, I don't have to worry about Jill because what Jill says she's going to do something, she's going to do it. And I was there. So that that's... That's one of those examples where, um, you know, you have other obligations that people expect you to have now to do this, but no, I have to keep honoring the ones that I've already made. I had another example where everyone was going to Alaska. I had been invited to be a judge there, and everybody who was anybody was going to Alaska. And, but I had made a commitment to uh, a smaller community mm. um, prior to that. <clears throat> and so I got a call, um, and my memory, Scott Rodriguez had called me and said, Jill, come on, you can blow up that other place. Come on, everybody's gonna be here, you gotta be here. And I remember saying to Scott, I said, Scott, I made a commitment to this community to be there. Pretty important to them. And if I were to blow them off, what would I do for you? You know? So I committed. I made a commitment to be here. I mean, I sure as hell wanted to be up there in Alaska. It was all paid expenses, the whole nine yards. And I, you know, they were going to roll out the red carpet. This, this is, I'm not exaggerating. And I, I said, but no, I, I must be at this event that I committed to, to judge this event for them. So everyone was there and I was at this community, which I had a great time. Don't get me wrong. I, uh, but Again, honoring the commitments yes. that one has made. So all of that has been intertwined in how <clears throat> I've been interacting in the kink style, in uh, the B BDSM, uh, from my roots into BDSM, and the evolution from BDSM to leather, to kink, to where we are today. Take me back to the very beginning of <clears throat> leather and kink for you and the beginnings of homosexuality, all of that. Take me to square one on that. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I grew up being very religious, okay, and, and naive. Religious and naive. Uh, so I really didn't know a hell of a lot about <clears throat> sexual, uh, sexuality, none of that. Um, I, I remember having good friends, female friends, and we were very close. And I always believed my thing was that, you know, you can have a really, really close friendship with, with, with uh, someone without it crossing the line or being something else. Um, and you have to understand back in the day, people really didn't come out and talk about, you know, homosexuals. Um, uh, gay wasn't really a term that was used. They either said, you know, that person's a fag or that this person is a lesbian, or she likes women. It didn't click for me what that meant. You know? What does that mean? I remember having a very close friend of mine, and we were uh, so close. And, and she was a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> that was the other uh, thing that we had. And, and that's okay, because, you know, I, I, I was uh, 
somewhat religious. I would say somewhat, but I, I had a very good foundation in, in that belief. Uh, and so we became very close. We, we slept together. I don't mean, and we slept in the same bed. But then our adults, because I was just 18, I was getting ready to go to college. And her family, my family was talking about, it just, just doesn't look right. It doesn't look like right for two women to be so close. And I, I guess she, being 21, knew more about what they were talking about than I did. I'm like, look at friends. Why are they trying to make it something more than what we are? You know? Um, I just I just didn't get it. I think she did as to what the implications were. Um, and, the, and the friendship... Um, ended. I was broken hearted, <laughs> you know, that I lost my best friend because of what other people were saying. She broke it off? Mm -hmm. Okay. She broke it off. She broke it off after I spent a week. I'm, I'm a, I write poetry. I've always written poetry. And I wrote the most beautiful poetry book. I set it to music, different because I was inspired by it. Music. Um, I Parts of it was illustrated and put it together, you know. I, I thought I was just doing a, just creating the most awesome thing that I could give of myself. Uh, and I remember taking her to this nice little park and then having a little cassette and playing, sitting the book in front of her and playing. I stayed up all week. I know when I said I was like sleep deprived, working on this and, and being inspired and putting this, uh, it was a friendship book okay. um, of poems. <clears throat> And shortly after that, she broke it off. So, yeah, you could see what her heart came in, but it wasn't, uh, again, it wasn't sexual. It was just losing a very dear, dear friend. How did it progress for you from that? Um, well, I've always been quiet and reserved and to myself, very private. Um, I, there, there's always been something that has followed me through childhood, through high school, through college, and that was, she's very strange. She's different. I felt I was different. I didn't know why or how, or whatever it was, but I, I just knew that I was a very different creature uh, in the scheme of things. Um, so from high school, I wanted to get rid of that label because, you know, what kid wants to be <clears throat> different, strange, how may outcasts? Um, but the other thing was I was able to blend into many different groups, okay. whether they were the smart kids or the outcast kids, or the athletic, or what have you, I was able to blend into those groups, uh, which I found, as, as I look back, it's been interesting that, you know, even though you were strange and different, and that's how people viewed you, still you were able to be a part of those different groups, you know. Uh, so when I went to college, uh, prior to, uh, to realizing my grandfather was the first one who ever went to college. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, ah, I'm the first one to graduate. I'm the first one to go to college. Mm -hmm. So when I went to college, I thought, you know what? Here's an opportunity. No one knows me. I can get rid of that stigma, you know, of being strange. Damn it, if I can go there and guess what? I was labeled strange strange but brave 
That's what I got. But when you say strange, what does that mean? That was what I was trying to find out what it means. It was, you're not like everybody else. That's what I, because when I tried to ask, what does that mean? It's like, you're just not like everybody else. Hmm. And yet there's a, was a, an attraction to me, you know, because I guess, I don't know what I was putting on or putting out there that attracted men and I was very much into men and again having my shall we say uh, religious philosophy uh, which was I'm going to save myself until I get married oh, okay. <laughs> so you know and for some reason every man that I've been with had, had respected that you know even my teacher who taught, was teaching Swahili, had an attraction to me and wanted to sleep with me. <laughs> you know, back when you could do these things and not, you know, be accused of, of um, uh, crossing the line. Right. right? So, um, when I would ask them what, to, to, to define it, that, they couldn't even define it. It's like, it's just something different, but you're brilliant. Because I wrote and people got to know that I was a writer. And not only did I write my poetry, I dramatized my poetry. And that's very, very different back in the day where you would get up there and, and, and dramatize it and do it. Um, like a performance art? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I also wrote plays. So I directed, um, what do you call it? Direct, produce, write, acted, did the whole thing. Wow. Um, <clears throat> in my old, and I did one big production before I left high school. And when I say for a small town to do, everyone came out. I went door to door to sell tickets, I sold out. It was standing room only. Wow. Uh, I went to the high school, like, Asked them if I could uh, use the auditorium to do this. They gave it, donated it to me for free. All right. So that was not a cost out of my pocket. I got people from the neighborhood to be participants in this. It was, it was called Monday's Child. And it, it, it really talked, it, it, it kind of reflected my life. The child that lived in the, the suburbs, but really didn't know what it was like to live poor in the ghetto. And so working on a college thesis, this young man goes and, and spends time in a ghetto and learns about the addictions and all. I wow. turned out to be the addict. And that was the hardest part was to get my head into that whole thing to be an addict. Um, and to reach out for a mother who's uh, trying to save a daughter who has two kids. Mm. Um, and then to, to go back into his suburban life, whose father is a minister, uh, whose sister is now pregnant, whose father is losing religion because he's going to, you know, you're, you're pregnant and, and uh, you want to live your life. And then he this son relays what he saw and the point of it is that there is no difference everyone has their problems yeah whether you live in the suburbs or whether you live in the ghetto what was the name of your play monday's child monday's child okay. i think that's child full of woes or something but I, I, that was the name of it it it, it was hell and i and i got to do it again at college and put it on where did you attend college uh man very good Montclair State, and it's now Montclair State University. In New Jersey. In yes. Upper New Jersey, yes. uh, Northern New Jersey. <clears throat> we were there where you could look out of the picture windows where our dorm was, and you could see New York City. Oh, The skylights wow. of yeah. New York City. Yeah. And again, coming from Southern New Jersey, Going up to northern New Jersey is like day and night south to the north. Um, my life has been 
almost the things I've read about. My favorite author was uh, James Baldwin. Uh, guess what? I my I and her mother enter my poetry book. I had written a little poetry book into the James Baldwin contest, and then I won honorable mention. Oh, and so I have a plaque. Uh, stating that, I, that, you know, I didn't win it, but uh, just, you know, 5,000 entries and you get honorable mentions out sure. of that. Uh, but reading his stories about that life and the first time that they took us college program that I was participating in took us to New York City. I was fascinated to see a play. Wow. Or the, but I was not only fascinated by the play, but I was fascinated by what I saw because these prostitutes and life and the city and all. As I'm riding in the bus and looking out the window, I am just like my face is glued. Like these are street walkers. And you don't see that in southern New Jersey in a Quaker town. These are, these are real live characters. <laughs> yes. You know, and I just was so fascinated by that. The interesting thing is, I, I got to see New York at night. Yeah. What I realized the first time that I would catch a bus and go over to travel from New Jersey to New York to Port Authority there. Uh, to catch a bus that would go back to New Jersey and travel down to southern New Jersey. And I got a ride, and you come out of the tunnel. The first time we came out of the tunnel, into New York, into the daylight, and I saw all these people moving. It was frightening. Wow. <laughs> For me, it was like, I was just like, almost like claustrophobic. I just couldn't believe the number of people that was moving and bustling about. And this was New York in the daylight. It was, I had to get used to that. I had to get used. The transition from this really goody good person to trying to find out what life was out there. This is the journey. How, so how did that journey begin? Well, there's the track of uh, the artistic side of me. Um, so we'll, we'll go down that track a little bit. Okay. Um, one of my key mentors who taught me really what I would say how to be a woman was a man by the name of John Downs. Downs, okay. Downs. Uh, one of my counselors who I rarely shared my works with, but she was a writer, um, Paula Danziger. Um, she was a writer, she had published a book. She was a counselor. She was my counselor. Um, and she saw that I was different and strange and that I was not, she understood it. Whatever it was about the, me, there was potential there. And so uh, she introduced me to John Downs. Um, as John relays, the first time he saw me doing a poetry, he's like, uh, but he didn't give up on me either. Um, he, he ran a theater called Venture Theater in Metuchen, New Jersey. And so he took me under his wings. And at the time he taught me how to be a woman. When I say that, he said, if you're going to be a woman that drinks, drink bourbon, mm -hmm. 150 proof, right straight off. Okay, I'm drinking. Because, you know, I, I did drink, I learned to drink, uh, but that was one of the things that he, he said to drink, drink it. Show him that you're a woman. As a woman, when you say no, mean no. And when you say yes, mean yes. Don't play games, okay? 
Uh, he saw me as a woman who was very strong, uh, articulate, intelligent, and a Leo. And he said, you know, one, you listen, and then you pass. You are female Leo. Watch for your opportunity to go in and to grab him. Whether it was in a meeting, but on stage, he taught me how to deliver my poetry in a way that would go and grab the audience and put them in the palm of your hand. There is a, there is, you know when you have them. Yeah. And that is <clears throat> you stripping away everything and bearing your soul. And once you bear the, your soul, you can feel them coming in. You can bring them to tears. Um, we used to do a thing called theater and music in the streets. Wow. Oh my God. The first, I'll tell you, people say, how do you endure a lot of things? Huh? The first time I went to deliver my poetry in the streets <clears throat> of New Brunswick, in the ghetto, hmm. I got booed. Oh. I was so get off the stage, and I'm trying to deliver and do my poetry, and people are like not having it. And you know, at that point, you're ready to walk off the stage, but it takes a lot to stay there and endure that. I don't know what transition from one summer to the following, but the following summer when I went up there again, something, I don't know what changed, but you could hear a pin drop and people saying, shh, she's doing her project. That's the one. And I would look up because it's like you're in the ghetto, you're in the projects, and you know, it's like cages and people are looking out in the audience and they listen. They wanted to hear what I had to say. And when I say the audience was quiet, I mean that. Did. And that was just like day and night coming from being booed one year. To being said, shut up, I want to hear, listen. Why were you, why were you choosing to do it there? Um, it wasn't my choice, it was what the theater did. Oh, I see. <laughs> you I know, see. you went where and performed wherever uh, oh. they, funds were back in that day. I see. So New Brunswick was one that uh, Jane Jay was one of the sponsors of it. Um, and the Urban League, in okay. conjunction with the Urban League. And it was something that you know, you go out and entertainment, something for to, to bring to people during the summers. Okay, uh, okay. You know, um, free entertainment. Okay. Um, and we would put up stage. I know I had to, it was a lot grueling to put up that stage and then break down that stage and then go up there and perform that stage. And so, uh, but then in the theater it was different, but still is, was about the delivery. I learned how to deliver my words that I had written um, to various music that I had chosen that inspired me. And when you say, well, what kind of poetry did you write? Whatever, it could be uh, about a child. Um, when we, were do you have a witnesses or I was trying to be one. Hmm. And I remember we were going to door to door and this one little child was about the range, barefoot. And she's like, I'm like, don't you think you need to go inside? Cause it looks like it's about to rain out here. And the child said to me, I never get sick in the rain. And I wrote a poem about a child who never gets sick in the rain in the ghetto when a mother cries, when things are just dismal, and this little child says, I never get sick in the rain. Wow. And it was, uh, 
it was with the music and it was quite a it's quite a piece there was programs that were created to encourage kids to go to college okay um, these programs were called uh, economic economical opportunity programs eop or e eof economical opportunity funds and so the government created funds for uh, uh, people of color and people from uh, economical backgrounds that probably would not have had an opportunity to go to college, uh, to go to college. Uh, I happened to, my counselor again, coming from a very good school, school system. As a matter of fact, today it's probably up in the top 25. Oh wow! Schools. Okay. So okay. that uh, had a very good educational background, um, but I was labeled a slow learner. Oh yeah, uh, most most black students, black kids, were labeled slow learners. What I was was probably a gifted. If they had ever did yeah. the program, you know. Um, my brother, on the other hand, was a certified genius, and I looked at him because he, though we came up in the same upbringing, he was so brilliant that no one knew what to do with him, and he yeah. became bad. Yeah. Not terribly bad, because he was a very lovable, likable guy, everybody loved him, but he just found his way to do trouble. That was my brother. That mm. was that. So um, my whole thing was to, to show that, you know, the whole family was not like my brother. Uh -huh. um, but I worked very hard, and that's why I said study hard. And while I was, you know, secretary for my church and got to speak from the pulpit or read the scriptures, and I was just, you know, people, when they saw me, they saw a very different person. Yes. Um, I broke away from that whole institutional uh, before before I left to go off to college because I remember I was in uh, um, Bible study, uh, Sunday school class, in the senior class, and the minister happened to be at the in the class at that on this particular day, and I questioned something. I said, how can that be? And I don't remember exactly what I questioned, but I remember his response was, well, you can't take everything literally. And I remember another question where I had asked him, it was, you know, literally this, and now you're saying you can't take everything literal. And my mind went, that doesn't make sense. Why didn't you just say you didn't know? Hmm. Yeah. And because of his response, I just didn't have any belief in what they were saying anymore. Wow. I went, I, you know, you're talking out both sides of your mouth, and so I really don't have trust in what you're saying. And so... While I have a relationship with the Creator and I will keep that, I'm not going to have a relationship with the church. So I remember seeing Viola and thinking to myself, I'm sizing them up and saying, now if I'm assigned to one of these graduate assistants, I want the weakest one, <laughs> mm -hmm. who turns out to be the good friend of the dorm director. Um, and I'm watching Miss Johnson, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't like her. She's a person of color, but she's bougie, bourgeois. She's nouveau rich. She speaks very articulate. Uh, um, she's got class and taste. She's very outgoing, and I'm I'm watching all this, and I'm like. I don't want to be assigned to her. <laughs> God. 
Ms. Johnson did something. I can't swim. I was telling Judy, Judy, Judy Tolling's been here since Thanksgiving. Uh, so she's been here and we we're talking about um, near, near death experiences. Um, and I, I didn't have a near death experience. I had one, but I remember we're up on this ledge, rocks, I'm sitting there, everyone's swimming in a swimming hole. Johnson's an excellent swimmer. I don't know what happened. I slipped and fell. I remember going straight down into the water. Mm. And I remember <clears throat> hearing everyone above me because I, the theory was that if you struggle and if you see a life flash before you, you know you're dying type thing. I didn't see that. I'm very calm waiting. And I hear them saying, I don't think she can swim. She, she did say she couldn't swim. I hear this conversation. Who jumps in a war and saves me but Ms. Johnson? And I, thus was the beginning of this and Thus is beginning of this journey with this person. Uh, so then we're told who our assignments are. And the dorm director... Um, calling me down specifically to explain to me that I'm going to be assigned to Viola Johnson. Yeah. Prepare me for this. For some reason, I was singled out. I had to go up there and I went up there to meet Viola Johnson. I gave her a false name. <laughs> He's like, who are you? Are you so and so? No, I'm not. I'm so. All the other ones are looking at me like, oh. I'm like, don't you say I do. No one said anything. We had this little, Vi doesn't skip, skip a beat in her orientation. Cross out, write my name down. And we go on with it afterwards. Okay. Eh, I'm not going to stick to the slide. I said, okay, I, I am so and so. Oh, you are. Well, I'm your graduate assistant. Okay. I don't know what it was about Miss Johnson that she began to, she saw potential. She was one of those, again. But I was skipping, I was, uh, I was uh, decided that I had met this lady, this girl who's attending college, she's 40 years old. I was just like 20. She's 40, 45. She has seen life and I wanted to find out what life was out there. You know, she's very likable. Every lo everyone loved her. Her hair was down to her waist. She, she was um, mixed Native American, uh, black, beautiful. Um, so articulate, so you know, people just gravitated to her, mm -hmm. and I gravitated to her, and I said, I'm gonna make her my best friend, and she's gonna teach me what life is on the outside. So, uh, I did, I edged out everyone and became her best friend, and we became running buddies, and, and we would go open up the, the, the new bars, and we just did a lot of things, and I learned, uh, I learned a lot about life outside, drinking and getting up and <sighs> I didn't know I was walking out. Miss Johnson is watching me. One thing Miss Johnson did one night was uh, she came into my room and I was working on some of my poetry and I had it open. And Miss Johnson asked me what I was working on. I, I told her and she came over and picked up my poetry and took it. And why I allowed her to do that is beyond me. And she walked out the room. Couldn't explain it. All I know is I was partying and having a good time. One of the things about my friend is that she learned I was a virgin and 
you know, then they begin to say, well, what are you into, men or women? Or, yeah, well, don't you like men and the whole nine yards? And in that question, I began to question my own sexuality at that point. And so to prove to myself that it was, I went to, I had sex, let's put it that way, with one of, uh, one of her, her friends, male friends. Uh, so that was my first sexual experience, you know, all the time, not really knowing a whole lot about it. You think, okay, back in the day, you're going to get pregnant or some crap like that. So I said, well, I think that should put that to bed now. You know, there shouldn't be any question about my sexuality. I'm just not interested in sex. But if I was, it would be with the male. Um... In the meantime, I think, I don't think, I know what happened. We, we then met up with two cops, um, but prior to that, let me just step back and say, now my fantasy. At the time the Mac came out, uh, Superfly, I don't know where this fantasy came up in my head, but my fantasy was to be a high-class pimp. Not a madam, a pimp. A pimp who had a stable of men and women who were articulate, and that's important, had class, a taste, you know, could, could go anywhere with a client, whether it's to a business dinner, you know, a gala, or um, whatever. But there was one other part to that. One other part that I, my training, I had this big elaborate training program. And part of the training was that they could endure any physical pain. You know, in case there was a client that had this, I don't know what it was, because I couldn't tell you. It was just thoughts that came to me that, you know, if, if they wanted to lash them or, you know, inflict some type of pain, that they could endure that type of pain. Miss Johnson trying to figure out who I was, what I was, what I wanted to do. Finally, one day just said, you know, what is it that you want? What do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And I think I'd be sarcastic of smart, smart mouth. I said to her, I want to be a pimp. She says, okay. So if you're, if you were a pimp, what would you do? I would train my stable. Okay, how would you train them? This, this, this conversation she was. I said, well, she said, well, why don't you train me? Now, she would have to tell you the other side of her thoughts. And we will later. All right. Um, <clears throat> but I lied to Miss Johnson. Uh, jumping around a little bit, I was supposed to be on duty one weekend. It, you know, everyone had to take a duty where you stayed around all weekend, stuck in case anything went down. And my friends convinced me, my boyfriend at the time and my running buddy, the older woman, convinced me, ah, don't go. Come on, we're going to have a real good time this weekend. So... Uh, I told Ms. Johnson that I had to go home because I had to have tooth extraction the next day, which was Saturday. Ms. Johnson gave me permission to leave and she would cover me. So Saturday comes around, Saturday night when I was supposed to return, my friends are like, don't go in, mm. you know, we're having such a good time, call her, tell her, you know, you're really in pain, don't go back. I call Miss Johnson, great actress that I am. Oh, I can't come. It's early, you know, bad extraction. Miss Johnson calmly says, no problem. 
I'll see you tomorrow, Sunday. Sunday comes around, I finally decide to go back. Um, I had a car, my father brought me a car. I drive, I park, I'm walking from the parking lot. And it's interesting, as I'm walking, I'm hearing Ms. Johnson wants to see you right away. Ms. Johnson wants to see you right away. And it, it is like a, a, a less than a quarter of a distance to um, I, where I'm parked to where the door is to the entrance to the dorm. As I'm walking, all I hear is people telling me. I get to the desk, I'm signing in, Ms. Johnson wants to see you right away. Okay, go to the elevators, right up to our floor, elevators open up, I'm about to walk out, and there's Miss Johnson. Before you take a step further, you're going to answer me a question. Where were you? So I opened my mouth to tell the lie, and before I can get halfway through it, Ms. Johnson slaps me. Mm -hmm. And slaps me hard enough that I slaps me down. I'm like, whoa, what, the, what just happened here? <laughs> so I get back up. And she asked the question again. And I'm like sticking to my lie. Ms. Johnson slaps me again and I'm back on the floor. And then she says, I'm going to tell you something before you get up the third time. Either you're going to get up and we're going to be the best of friends, or you're going to get up and I'm going to fire you. So think about that before you rise up. I rose up and she asked me the question a third time. And I tell her the truth. And that's when she, we had this conversation about what is it that you want to do yeah and so suddenly we're either in her room or my room her room's a little bigger and I'm doing things which I call training and I'm like explaining to her based on John Downs mentoring to me of that you can love without crossing that line. You can give all the love you have for a person. It doesn't have to cross that line into anything that is sexual or what have you. We had that relationship. We had such a close relationship. You would think that we were lovers, but we were not. Mm. So um, he loved me. I loved him. And the thought of it being beyond that didn't enter. And so I'm doing this training with Miss Johnson. So what I call training, I'm tying her up. I'm using my pimp stick, which is uh, a wire hanger with, with uh, uh, electrical tape around it so that it does not create marks or what have you. Um, I am doing things that are coming to my mind, helping her body transition to pain, helping her body, we set this limit, now I'm going to push it beyond that limit, and a little further, and a little further. We are secretly doing these things in the room. How did your journey in leather begin? In teaching Ms. Johnson the, the art of pain and explaining that the mind goes places where the body cannot. Little did I realize, little did we realize that that was the beginnings of our s and journey. Um, she submitted to me and I became her mistress, but terms we didn't really know about until we started reading more of Shiva's reading more. And more we did this journey, 
back in the day, she was making things for me. She made my first um, frail. Uh, and um, cuffs, what have you, no leather. If it was leather, it was either the cuffs that she made me um, and, and my leather frame. That was it. It was, it was jeans and a black top or really, I didn't have leather until I became them, so I'll be honest with you. Um, then we were wondering if there were other people out there like us. Mm. And so Ms. Johnson, because my commitment was, I will take care of you. I love you. There's a love there. I will take care of you. You stay here. You do the homely thing, you know, make sure when I come home, things are the way I like it. Dinner's ready, what have you. So we began setting up shop. Um, we, we went to New Brunswick to a place where you could buy these rags. You know, sex, it's not, not the sex shop, the novelty shops, you know. And we found this pamphlet. And uh, in the pamphlet, we read about this organization called the Orl Orland Spiegel. Orland Spiegel Society. Orland Spiegel Society. And so, guys, I, let's go there. Um, at this point, we had evolved where I put a chain around her or her around her neck, um, and had her on a leash, mm -hmm. and she had her cuffs. And back then, a slave came. My slave would not look up, would not speak, unless spoken to. Uh, the thought was that you are not worthy to look upon your mistress or master, master, unless granted permission. Uh, went to Orlis Spiegel, came in the door, beautiful black man, bald head, this, this voice that just filled the room. Welcome, come in, little sisters, come in. That was Jack Jackson. And Jack Jackson welcomed us and took us under his wings. Oh, wow. And because of the way that I carried myself and my slave, who was uh, an extension of me, you could tell, even though we had not had any formal training of anything like that, um, instinctive, these things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I earned his respect. And for a little person my size, so I was like a, a size three or two, the power that I could wail with my flogger, but more importantly, I also learned the art of how you could inflict pain without exerting a lot mm -hmm. by the pressure points. Mm -hmm. So I started to study the body and could do that. Just, and it looked like I was just touching people. Giant men would fall at the flick of what I could do to them and bring them mm -hmm. down. Now, now you are wailing. You are exuding a, a, a lot of a, a lot of power, energy out there. Um, and once you got in the door, that opened the door to other places because. We had to be very discreet. I was an executive, an executive. So my life during the day had to be one way where you're wearing mm -hmm. the suits and skirts and uh, being corporate-like. And then at night, I'm an entire diff entirely different person yeah. going out when we had energy. And that opened the door to other parties, other secret gatherings and places. Um, and when I would come in with buy and tow, it's like people would part. It was... Oh, how beautiful. You know, you're naive and don't realize what you're doing or how you're carrying yourself, but people are admiring you, you know, um, and admiring how my slave behaves. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I remember Jack and uh, the chief was another prominent black uh, um, person in the uh, scene. It wasn't a lot of people of color, not a lot. And not only that, but Vi and I found ourselves all over. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, again, back like you fit in, whether it was a heterosexual gathering, whether it was a lesbian gathering, whether it was, that's how we met um, Joe Arnone, Gail Rubin, Patrick Califia, Dorothy Allison. We were, we were playing and they were talking about a little gathering of women. Come on, you gotta come. We go there, it's an apartment. But all these women were into kink and leather. And, and I remember we were all sitting there talking and, and Gail was talking about, well, we're getting ready to, to move to California and different ones. Are, and it's like, gee, we just met these folks. You know, and they're all taking off and Joe uh, is going to start LSM. Uh, so we were right there. El, what, for the benefit of the audience, what is LSM? Um, Lesbian what? Sex Mafia. There you go. All right. She was uh, on, on, uh, in the process of uh, starting this Organization for Women of King, BDSM. Um, that was our our leather journey, and, and, it, and it grew, and we met uh, Ann Pierce, and we built a place, because it was an apartment, we needed to move, and Ann was in the middle of getting a divorce, we became co-owners, she had her slave, I had my slave, and we built Paradise Island. Paradise Island became the Disney World of Leather at the time. Wow. It was, uh, it was uh, n it wasn't, no, there was no place, private gathering like what we had built, had my slaves built. And we had a top floor that was all play equipment. Everything that we created from imagination, suspension systems that had not even been thought about <laughs> or there. That's, it, 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 it became a place people were able to create. And uh, then I had my private dungeon on my floor. She had her private dungeon on her floor. And then the basement was the medical room oh, and, and wow. dungeon. So, and it had, the way the house was designed, it had ways that you could come up the back way front, or, or the front way and go into these places without going into our apartments. Okay. And what drove us from Hellfire, I remember when Hellfire opened up, you know, word got around, Hellfire, this new dungeon, this new place, you know, it was a bring on, uh, on the brown bag. Hellfire was our own little hole. And God knows, it was a hole. <laughs> All right? Um, if you went in there, if you touched the walls because of the sweat, you could feel the grime and what have you on it. it was, but it was our hole. And we also thought we were playing safe. Okay? Chris go all over the place. But, you know, and, and you also learned how to hit certain spots where it was not abusive, though we didn't talk about abuse, but the thing was you don't want to injure or damage anyone. So you didn't hit in the kidneys. You didn't do this to the heart, you, didn't, yeah. you know? Whereas we respected when someone was doing a scene, it was like artistic. Let me explain that. It was very artistic to watch. We policed ourselves. You know, it was like a person like Jack Jackson or the chief, then if they saw something going on, it was not safe. You got called out. If you called out, it was the worst thing that could happen. Because called out meant, hey, stop that. That's unsafe. You don't do that. I don't care if you are the mistress or master or what have you. And that would, you didn't want to be called out. Yeah. All right? Yeah. So, because w when people play, it's a, like you stop and watch. Mm -hmm. Because it was the ex power, what we call today, power exchange. The mm -hmm. energy and what have you, watching it and learning from each other was so beautiful, so artistic to me. 
but once the we lost that gathering because it became a tourist trap, tourist trap in the sense that people were coming in now, they're drinking their drinks, and now they're interrupting your scene. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're touching your, your property, they're touching your, your equipment, hit her harder. I go, wait, wait, you don't know. Mm -hmm. That it was, that's not. So we gravitated to private parties. And to get into these private parties meant you got a private invitation. Yeah. So, you know, and people were climbing to get invitations to the parties that we hosted for people like Manute Bonclief, who came back to this country and stayed with us. Our parties were elegant with champagne and caviar <laughs> wow. and people coming in, you know, you come in in your best leather gowns or your regular gowns or what have you. And we had the servants that were there serving with elegant. Um, I, I was more like, um, who's the guy that um, uh, had the big mansion? Hugh Hefner. I was more like Hugh Hefner. Oh, Hugh Hefner oh. would show up for his parties, make an appearance and leave. I'm a very shy person. I showed up for the parties. People asked where Jill was. Jill showed up, and then Jill disappeared. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. I was more, I like to say, in the background. Um, but then when we got into the play, we had the parachute room where you could go play. We had the main place. You had a sitting room. You had so many rooms where you could go down to the basement, to the medical room or the dungeon, equipment, cages. We had a, a suspension system wow. that had been designed for us where it was a table. And then you could flip it. You could flip it all the way. You could suspend them this way. It, it, this is why it was called the Disney Wall. Yeah. And it was open to our friends and family members. We, could, we actually probably were the first to come up with the family. Uh, because we shared our property um, and it became known as Paradise Island and Jill and Ann Pierce and part of the family we would welcome people in, but there was, again, you had to act like a family member, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and if you broke the family rules, we had family rules, uh, you know, no lying, no stealing, um, and act right. And if you broke no drugs, drugs mean like hard drugs, because that came up a situation where we had to deal with it with one of the uh, people we welcomed in. Mm -hmm. uh, and people gravitated to Paradise Island and wanted to be a part of the family. And I remember, you know, you take care of family members. Uh, Mistress Mir met, at the time it was Mir. Uh, and I, she was working for Belle de Jour. And I remember one night uh, they were all stuck over there because one of the, they went down and someone had attacked one, one of them and stole their money. And uh, Belle de Jour had, was not going to put more security and, and wasn't going to send anyone to escort them out. They called us. Uh. And we gathered up the family by myself. Um, I met Ed and I forget the other person. People were long gone and we went over there. Arm for bear. <sighs> we went up there like, like we were gangbusters, you know? I don't know what. We, all I know is we went up there and escorted them out without an incident. And we were prepared wow. To, wow. to deal with anything that was going to go down. My job took me all over the country. And so the roots started in New Jersey and then my job took me to all the way to California. We met people there and started, I mean, wherever we went, we were, we found ourselves a part of the helping community. to build. Yeah. Yes. Yeah that we didn't realize that's what we were doing at the time. Yeah. Uh, so we went and, and was part of the rebuilding of Leather and Lace, another uh, orga uh, women's organization club. Uh, 
and and okay, we did many things. Well, not there's uh, Janice Society of Janice Society of Janice, and mm -hmm. that's where I met. Uh, not at Society of Janice, but in California is where I met Guy Baldwin for mm -hmm. the first time mm -hmm. and Ray Spanion. They were yes. in a relationship at the time, um, and, and 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 again, we're still at the coming budding, you know. Uh, sharing, exchanging information. One of the things that is key that happened here was that, again, uh, Nan Burroughs and John Burroughs had been in the scene a long time, a long time, and had collected a lot of uh, magazines and things that were very discreet. Mm -hmm. And so, by I sit by to, as an extension, as as my slave to go and help them because I believe. John had had a heart attack, something, I sent her out there. And so we ended up moving out there. Uh, she was cleaning out the closet and began to see these books. And uh, they're crumbling. I remember that night I came home from work and she's like, look at this, look at this. I got to preserve, we got to save this stuff. And I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Go ahead, save it. And that was my reaction little did i know that saving it would turn that one conversation would turn into what we have today which is the carter johnson library the carter johnson library yes. uh, she started saving a lot of stuff we left california went to oklahoma now you're transitioning as time is lapsing we're, we're now coming to another a new generation of folks called leather generation and and they're speaking a little different language we're still, we're still in touch with it but now uh women were daddies could be daddies and uh could have these pronouns and what have you uh, and again we went there and it wasn't leather but then they realized that we were kinky and poly and i have to say again we were on a cut it cutting edge of poly. The people didn't understand that you could have a poly mm -hmm. relationship. I've had it since just about, since meeting by, I was in a, she was very open about it. And uh, uh, Oklahoma was very curious about that. So it opened the door to others to say, well, it's, maybe it's possible, you know? So you, you, you're on the cutting edge of family and showing people what family could be and what that looked like. And now we're on the cutting edge of what poly and what poly could be. And people think, saying, is it possible? Is it okay? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, we were in the rodeo, how two black women who never had horses in their lives <laughs> ended up in the rodeos beyond me. But that evolved from that to, we, we got these, you guys are kinky. We've got an organization that's going on, um, Tulsa. Uh, I ended up going there and ended up being a secretary and officer. At the same time, just this evolution of, just on the transition of, that's when Enzel was first Enzel. International Miss Leather. International Miss Leather. And I remember Devin talking about their getting ready to have this thing out in Portland. And Jill, Devin had met Judy Tallwing, and um, I stayed in the background. I, I was not out because of my job. Um, in contests, suddenly they're talking about these contests, and feeder contests into insults. So it was slowly building, and Vi would pull me out to come make appearances here and there. And, you know, they'd ask me because of our, I don't know what it was, because she spoke my name, you know, um, and talked about the things and the roads and that we had traveled. Um, so if they could get me out, I would either be a judge or I was slowly doing something to these contests, be yes. a participant. Um, and over a couple years, I had seen everything. I've been, you know, done mom, or whatever it was. I saw this, 
evolution of the contest from every aspect, even being the MC and all this. And I hadn't seen it through the eyes of a contestant. So what prompted you to I run for that? Hadn't seen it from the eyes of the contestant. And I said, I want to do it for the experience. And boy, did you. <laughs> <laughs> That's when Miss Johnson, like when I, it was at we were in Dallas, and I just finished up doing whatever. I don't know if I was judge or what have you. And I said to her, "You know what? I think I'm going to run for Emsel." That is when she put the brakes on, parked the car, and asked <laughs> me, "What did I decide?" I said, "I think I want to run for Emsel." I want, I want to experience this, this thing. And she was the, the head judge for Intel. And she, re, she renounced, she took a step back from that. Okay. And one of the things she said to me is, this is not something you just do for the experience. If you're going to run for Intel, you're going to run and you're going to win. Because my leather family that we had put together there, some of them were going to run for Ensel. We're saying, what if you win? And I'm like, but I don't want to win. That's not why I'm running. <laughs> I'm running for the experience. But, but they're saying, what if you win? And I'm like, I didn't have an answer. Because I was, in my mind, it wasn't going to win. Oh my God. It was just going to be a participant. But Look when I you. finally hit me that you needed to do this to win. Came a whole different ball game then. And just before we went out to the stage, I remember Vi uh, giving me Judy Sash, telling me to go look in the mirror and see what I saw. And I said, when I looked in the mirror, first of all, Judy Sash was big as I don't know what, heavy as I don't know what, I put it on. But I said, I see a winner. And I also felt the heaviness of that sash mm -hmm. and the heaviness of that responsibility. That's right. And when my name was called, um, I didn't hear it. And the person standing next to me said, it's you, Joe. You're the new Enzo. What were your feelings about that? Because you were the first one. This, this was a word I was taught, BIPOC. Black Indigenous person of color to win, Imsel. Thoughts on that? Back then, 1996, it was like, Jill is the first Black Imsel. Okay, I thank you for believe, being politically correct, but that's what it was. The first, um, it did not even cross my mind that, that, that I was making history in our leather community in that way. Um, as I heard it more and more, it was like, okay, so you're the first black insult. Uh, what are you going to do? What is, and I wanted a platform mm -hmm. and my platform was about preserving the women's history. That was my pl platform. Um, and we had the, the get link. Um, Joe Gallagher was IML. Mm -hmm. And he had the get link where everyone was putting links on and linking up to who their family on. And I'm looking at this this chain that's just growing across the country. And I'm like, gee, you know what? I'm just collecting a woman's history. <laughs> that's that's nothing. That's pale compared to what what uh, Joe is doing. Um, I um, it was Mid Atlantic. I remember going to Mid-Atlantic. Uh, it was the first year that no major title holders were there. Every year, all everyone that I am um, Mid-Atlantic kicked off our our leather season. Yes, mm -hmm. um, still does. Still does, but that was the year that IML didn't show up. That was the year that international. Mr. Leather didn't show up. All the international title holders went somewhere else. 
What was going on? Some other event, and they decided, ah, we're, we're just going to skip this. It oh. really was shocking. Wow. Um, and and I remember that Chuck Winslow was a judge. He was, he was, one of, he was a judge that year. Um, so I was, I was the only international title holder that was there. Uh, it was the time that they allowed the international folks to speak. They called me up, um, and we were at tracks. It was like 2,500 people at tracks. I didn't know what to say. I just spoke from the heart and talked about our history. Um, I talked about AIDS, and I explained that we didn't realize that what we were doing might commit, uh, transmit this disease called AIDS. Um, we were playing as safe as we knew. It took out a whole generation yeah. of leather people, leather men, who would have taught the next generation. We lost them through this. We need to preserve our history. Um, Chuck Winslow was in the audience and I talked about the Leather Archives and Museum and it was always in the red. It had not since it opened up had been in the black. And I looked at the audience and I said, you know what? We spend more money on drinks. This is our history. This is our legacy. So I'm asking everyone here tonight to just donate one dollar. One dollar would get us out of the red and into the black. One dollar. The rest is history. We collected. The hats were going. People collected and we collected. Oh, close to $3,000 that night. Incredible. And people heard about this speech um, and what had happened because for the first time, um, the lamb was able to pay its bills and it was in the black. And so everywhere I went that year, not only was I collecting the women's history, but everyone wanted to be a part of giving history. Yeah. And it took on a life of its own. Because you also were able to gather enough funding for the current building that houses the archives. That was the following year. Oh, okay. The, the momentum of collecting all of this. What happened was, at the end, when it became IML, <clears throat> well, when I took all the history that I had gathered, it covered a big stage. They had to get a stage to put all that history on okay. it okay. and to display it and buy. We cataloged it. Um, one of the things I can say is that they accounted for every dollar mm -hmm. that I collected. There was no scandal about any money mm -hmm. because I collected it, I counted it, and I came back and told people what was the total. And if one penny was missing, it came out of my pocket. And I sent certified checks to the land every place I went and kept that for that year, the community. Thing about it is we did a transition. We were so used to doing for AIDS and it was such a sad that my transition to the community was we can preserve our history. And it became uplifting yes. and the community came together to uplift ourselves out of the depression of AIDS. Yes. You know, we continue to to get to, to raise funds for that, but now we could do something else in a positive way. Have you any idea how much over the course of the year that you gathered? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. I, I don't. I it's quite a large sum, I can say that. Okay. All I know is that, you know, anywhere I went is at least over a thousand okay at every gathering and every gathering wanted to hear this so the following year because i had gathered so much history 
that, and, and then the day I won IMSA, the next day I said to my community, hey, let's gather enough history that that, that we will force Chuck Rizzo to have to get a bigger building. <laughs> that was my speech to him. Well, we had gathered that, and Chuck realized that so much had come in that they needed a bigger building. Yes. So now it's 1997. Chuck has found this, this building literally almost the, the, the night before um, IML kicks off. Okay. They had the big board meeting. I'm no longer IMSO, uh, but they're like, we've got to raise $30,000 and Chuck will match it so that we'll have this down payment for this building. Got to have it by Monday morning. Okay. And Vi's there, as she has done right here, shoving me out there. And Vi said, well, your biggest cheerleader, your biggest person that does that is Jill. So she comes to me and says, guess what? I need a favor from you. I need you to go out there and raise money for this. I'm like, well, how? <laughs> As if you didn't know. Oh, well, I, I'm like, I'm not ready for this. And she said, we're going to get pictures of this building and they're going to have uh, slides in the back showing this building. And you go out there and you do what you you do best. And I went out there and inspired the people. And I said, this is ours. This can be ours, but this is what we need. I need everyone to give what you can give. And we raised $30,000 within 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Well, yeah. And it's not that I stayed out there for 30 minutes. It was that... They collected the money. We went back there. It was Chuck, uh, by myself, and Queen Cougar. And we are <laughs> counting this money. <laughs> and went back out and told them we had raised $30,000 all within 30 minutes. Incredible. And uh, you, you, that had to have been a source of immense pride for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's an understatement. Yeah. I will tell you as a very young Leatherman coming into the scene, I heard all about that. Wow. So that is a story that is so uh, profound in the leather community. And here I have the privilege <laughs> of sitting down with you, the woman who did it. Imagine. The woman who was the inspiration, but I always say it's the community. And what you can do when you come together as a community. We did it. And all I did was inspire people to remember that we're doing it for next generations yeah. to come. Um, I couldn't have done it without them. What are your thoughts? You were one of the founding members of the Onyx Pearls. Oh, wow. Uh, um, I'm called an OP, an original pearl, because again, there were not a lot of, um, especially women of color that was out in the leather community. And so Vi, myself, and Queen Cougar were very prominent known out there, along with Stacy Thomas. And so when uh, Men of Onyx made their debut in 1996, because I was judging ABW and that's when Mufasa came and announced. Mufasa Ali. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. announced this new organization. I remember it was Marcus, Mr. Marcus, myself, mm -hmm. Ernst Stewart, and um, um, Jesus, he's going to hate me for it. Oh, uh, my my name's. He's the prominent uh, MC. Frank Nowicki. Damn good friend. I can't even think of Frank. We were all like, who are they? <laughs> and we didn't know who they were. Um, but beautiful black men. And I remember going up to, they having this little party, you know, housewarming. And we went up there and they knew us um, walking in and just being in awe of these beautiful black men who had started um, Onyx Men. And I told Vi and Cougar, because they weren't at a ABW, 
I came back and I remember saying, you've got to meet these guys. You've got to see these men who have come together. So we're at IML a year. And I remember they were throwing another party and now you really have seen people of color come together. And, and outside this little room, a suite now, we moved up from a room to a suite. And I remember the three of us walking down and walked, seeing the sea of leather mm. of, of people of color. And first of all, not having seen that gathering. And as we were walking down the hall, I remember the respect that the men gave us. As Again, again it's like the parting. Everyone wow. just parted for us to, to enter the room. And at that point, um, Ufasa and the other co-members, they said, you are, you are our jewels. You're like our, the, the pearls of us. They wanted us to start the, the Onyx Pearls for Women. At the time, we couldn't because we were traveling so much, and so we didn't have the time to do that. So we, we turned it down, and it was uh, Lady D who really was the one, was instrumental okay. in starting the first chapter of the Onyx Pearls. Lady D. Harrison. Lady D. Harrison. Yeah. I give it to her. She's went through hell, but if it wasn't for Lady D putting the chapters together, Onyx Pearl Women Organizations, because even though we struggle, we wouldn't be where we are today the different chapters that have sprung up all over the country. I hand it to her. I cannot take credit. What advice can you offer someone coming into the community who might want to be a title holder? What have you to say to them? What advice? First of all, I wrote the book on it. So yes. you want to be a title holder. So you want to be a title holder. So you want to be a title holder. Yes. Um, Still have copies and people are trying to get me to to put republish that book and it really does set the tone for if you want to be a title holder. I think these are the standards. The standards as title holders have diminished over time. I watched that happen because you know you couldn't find contestants. And so you grab any person off the streets, literally. Mm -hmm. you, you've flown in these judges and all. And now, because you have such high power judges, you have to tell the judges, well, because these people aren't really leather people, you know, you can't ask about your leather history, you can't do this and this and that. And over time, we diminished the standards that we had for title holders or, or what that contest meant. Um, that it wasn't just anybody who came off the streets. So my book tells you the standards of how you prepare your mind, body, knowledge, knowing your history, uh, presenting yourself, the best of yourself. It doesn't matter what size you are. What you want to do is you want to make sure that what you put on your body, you wear it. And it emphasizes the good points of you and it emphasizes your body and yeah. you wear it. Yeah. Um, so if you want to be a title holder, let's, let's go back to lifting up those standards. Let's not accept substandards um, and title holders who really aren't supposed to be out there because you're, these people are spokespeople um, and can be, have the potential. But guess what? You don't have to be a title holder to make a difference. And that's what my Unsung Hero Award was about, is the people I learned in the background. They were the people most important. Yeah, that's true. But you never hear from them. They don't get thanks. They don't get recognition. They all have a title. But if it wasn't for the volunteers and the people in the background, these things wouldn't happen. The, to me, that was the most important part of my journey through the title thing was meeting all those those people and when I created um, Miss Worrell 
This world was about everyone has a platform. One may take home the goal, but guess what? You have communicated your, plat communicated your platform. Everyone has heard it, your passion. You can go out there. It's about your passion. It's about all you have to do is not look for someone else to do it, but say to yourself, I can do it. Because it took me a while to figure out me put on contests, me produce a contest. I didn't think in a million years that I could do that. And yet, I broke the standards. I, I, I made it a very transparent event. It wasn't a contest, it was an event. It was for the more mature and experienced woman in the leather community. Um, it was about, can you, we had Crossfire where we had the reporters that fired these questions at these contestants in six, 90 seconds, you had to be able to feel those questions. My gosh. Um, that part became, that's what people love to watch, to see the Crossfire, how they handled mm -hmm. it. It was about uh, the whole time you're there, when the minute you start, your platform is on display, the um, interviews were open up for people to sit and watch. So you don't have to question, well, why did that person win over someone else? Yeah. Um, so you got an opportunity to, to see the judging and hear the questions and what have you. Um, it was about the experience and the, and the passion of that participant um, and raising for your charity and what have you. Uh, we did it for lupus, we um, did it for breast cancer, um, although um, Coleman didn't want our money. Coleman? Uh, the the be best known breast cancer out there that was collecting for money. Oh, okay. It, it, it was her, right? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. The, the number one breast cancer organization raising money at the time, I think it was the Coleman. They didn't want our money because mm -hmm. we were leather people. Mm -hmm. So we found another organization that would accept our money. Um, mm -hmm. We did a leather day of caring where we as a, a community uh, came together all across the country to do a day of caring for the leather people and to show people that we, you know, don't be afraid of us. Yeah. Human. Yeah. It opened doors and it linked us all across the globe, actually. Um, that was my brainchild. Karen McGee was the one who was the face of a, of a leather day of caring, and it was an awesome day. Now, that day that that happened, I was like, wow. I must say, even when I did Miss World and I finally looked, stepped back and looked at what I, I had actually put together, I was like, wow. <clears throat> Anything you wish you had done that you haven't? Yes. Um, I still have a few more books that I like to put out there. Uh, one goes back in time. It's called The Rite of Passage. It talks about what it was like to be in in the BDS community back in the early 70s. Wow. So it, it's sitting up in my, I, I want to publish that book. I'm not sure that people want to read that or hear about it. That, that was my, I do. Yeah, that was my thing. I do, I do. <laughs> so that's why I hung on to it. And then... Um, I'm actually working on my own memoirs, which I called uh, My Leather Journey, because I will confess that the book that Vi put out to um, obey, love, serve, obey, I've not read it. And we have an understanding I will not read it, because as my bringing up into the leather community, was that I had a responsibility to take care of my slave, my property. And 
if I loan my property out, I expect it to come back the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. take care of your property. You don't right. to destroy it. One of the things that I did, and, I, and I'm going to wrap this up for you, is that I taught Miss Johnson, you may be a slave, and you're out here to serve, and to serve in my name. Could you reflect me? Right. And, that, and that's what I said. I'm going to stay here and go to work and, and keep the be the anchor. You go out and serve the community in my name. Bring honor to me, which she has done. But I said, no one, no one has the right to abuse you. Not even me. So if there ever comes a time when I'm not in my right mind, as your mistress, as your owner, and I put you in jeopardy. You have every right to defend yourself or do whatever you have to do. Now, you will pay for it later. <laughs> As a reminder of your place. <laughs> but just know that just because I'm not there, don't think that you can take any abuse from anyone. That's my responsibility. Because there are things in the book that should not have happened, do you have to only say goodbye? Why did you let them happen? Because if you knew about them, there would have been hell to pay. And there will still be hell to pay to this day because I feel an obligation as your mistress, as your owner, that should not have happened. So we'll leave the book. It has been an inspiration for others who've come into the community, that journey. Um, all we want to do right now, we are both 70 years old. We just not only want to leave a legacy of history and knowledge, because that is power, you know, where they are burning books and yeah. destroying Sexuality is the most loved, most powerful energy in the universe. Yeah. yeah. But the legacy is not, it's that we have in place for this to live on for many, many generations to come. After we transition over, we want to make sure that this goes on, that these precious uh, items that we have collected for our community stay intact for all the community to enjoy, to learn. Um, that's, we, we, we've been doing it on a shoestring budget. We've been doing it out of our own pocket. Um, that's okay, because we've been blessed to be able to do that. We've been blessed to take it to the community. Not charging them, not trying to make money off of it. Just making sure that you have resources yeah. and you learn about where you, where we came from, where we've been. And then you go out there and create the next whatever. Jill Carter, I don't have vocabulary adequate to thank you. This thank has you. been an incredible interview, and I am privileged to have done this with you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we do this, we hug, but we're still in a pandemic, right? Yes. <laughs>